Hello, this is Lecture 8 in a series from Principles of Biochemistry, uh, Albert Langer, author. This is the 7th edition, and today we're going to uh, discuss uh, uh, what is more of a laboratory treatment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis proteins. We're talking about uh, protein synthesis, protein purification, and characterization. Uh, so we talk about uh, protein purification first, and the uh, classic method of purified proteins re uh, revolves around various forms of chromatography, which is the, uh, the separation of uh, substances. Newer methods have protein modification, and we'll, we can discuss a little bit of that also. So uh, the, the broad template of protein purification relies on the uh, same set of uh, 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 initial steps, which is the first of issue is to eliminate or rather liberate proteins by membrane lysis. Uh, so membrane lysis, you can use uh, uh, substances to break apart cell walls, cell membranes, uh, organelles if necessary, and obtain what's termed the crude extract. The crude extract, which is basically the purified non-particulate component of uh, the uh, organism then is uh, subjected to differential uh, speeds of centrifugation at certain uh, speeds. You can get the, uh, uh, the uh, protein of interest uh, depending on what you're looking at, whether you're looking at the uh, precipitate or the supernatant. Uh, fractionation then takes uh, whatever component is derived from the differential centrifugation. The fractionation relies on differences uh, among proteins between the pH, uh, temperature uh, uh, characteristics uh, where the uh, function is uh, acquired, size, uh, binding of, uh, uh, of uh, constituents to it, and salt concentration. So this is where the chromatography uh, cuts in right here, and we'll discuss some of those in detail. Uh, ammonium sulfate is a predominant uh, salt that's used to, uh, to selectively precipitate proteins and uh, you can remove uh, the given protein from solution depending on what concentration of ammonium sulfate you're using. So you add the ammonium sulfate in the concentration that you desire, you can centrifuge and then precipitate either uh, the part you want or the part you don't want and reconstitute it. So when we talk about uh, techniques, we're talking about, uh, first of all, dialysis, where you can rely on size difference, differences uh, through the, uh, the uh, permeable, uh, permeable membrane. You can also remove salts from this if you uh, precipitate the protein of interest with ammonium sulfate. You can remove those with dialysis and get equilibration of uh, ammonium uh, uh, sulfate and then get the protein reconstituted. Also, column chromatography is used in a classic uh, phase. A column is a stationary phase, and that the solution and the sample uh, uh, constitute the mobile phase. So, column chromatography uh, <clears throat> is analogous to thin layer chromatography and other forms where you've got a, a, a stationary phase and a mobile phase. The mobile phase moves over the uh, stationary phase, and you get separation based on some uh, characteristics that is amenable uh, to the protein of interest. So one example, a very common one, is uh, ion exchange chromatography, where the resin uh, in the column is charged and there's a bound anion uh, present and that's a cation exchanger, or vice versa. You can have a bound cation and have that be an anion exchanger. And then you add either a pH gradient or a salt gradient, and uh, under that salt or pH gradient, you get different uh, differences in charges or uh, ability to uh, uh, change the structure of the protein and expose these various uh, anion constituent groups or cation constituent groups and get separation that way. So, uh, for example, the column length is also critical. You don't want the uh, fusion of protein to be excessive and you can also narrow the concentration. So if, it, if you have a narrow concentration gradient of salt or pH, you can get rapid elution of the substance. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is that you'll get overlap of that protein with other ones. Similarly, you don't want uh, the gradient to be too large because that way you end up getting uh, uh, either no separation or there's diffusion of the uh, specimen over the length of the gradient. So the gradient of the protein that you're obtaining should be within a relatively narrow frame 
of test tubes. So if you've got, for example, the reservoir here and the pump there, and you can uh, put the protein sample in a, uh, up at the top here in the monolayer and then add the reservoir of, of solution to that and push the protein through here, and then it'll fractionate uh, over time over the uh, matrix of the, uh, of the protein and then elutes out the bottom. So there's a flow rate that can't be too fast nor too slow, but it has to be enough so you can get these, uh, sit, uh, these constituents to be adequately separated. If it's too great a gradient or too uh, slow on the, uh, uh, the administration of the solvent, then you get these bands. Instead of having tight bands, they're broad bands over here, and then you get this, uh, the protein over a broad number of, uh, of uh, test tubes, and you end up having a very dilute uh, and not particularly uh, 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 efficacious result. So one example, this is ion exchange chromatography where the resin uh, is uh, negatively charged. So it's a, a cation exchanger here. So there's a protein with positive charges. There's an ionic relation between the two and it is retarded relative to, say, less positively charged protein, which can go out uh, uh, quickly. So these are not of interest to you. You can, again, use a 280 nanometer uh, spectroscopy. Uh, to uh, get uh, uh, know where your protein is, and then you can do assays to find out if the protein of interest is in this uh, tube. It's all very uh, trial run, not quite hit and miss, but it's certainly uh, 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 something that you end up doing uh, oftentimes repeatedly in order to get the uh, particular result that you uh, desire. There's also size exclusion uh, chromatography where you've got these pores and the pores have a certain size and ones that are above that pore size will be eluted uh, and then uh, you get uh, the uh, uh, you get basically the, the biggest proteins coming out first and the medium size and the small ones and uh, proteins that you are, are aware of a given size you can certainly use the ex exclusion to get uh, this sort of separation. Is it uh, impossible to couple ion exchange and size? Not at all. You can use both of them in series, but uh, generally one of these is what is going to be operable. Um, this is an example here where you've got a protein with a ligand. This is a, a ligand bound protein where the ligand actually attaches uh, to the uh, protein in, in question and uh, then it will be excluded uh, uh, with uh, other uh, substances that will knock this off. So you can get unwanted proteins watch through the columns binding here and then you can have a ligand uh, uh, homolog and then get the protein of interest pushed through and this is what we call affinity chromatography. This is where uh, instead of a charge or a size you're actually using some quality that's specific to the protein of interest. And uh, you know, there, there are different categories of uh, proteins, particularly enzymes, and you can use those characteristics to help form a, a, uh, a bonding of, of some type here and then get the protein of interest out later. Gel filtration is a form of uh, size exclusion. Uh, this is uh, done oftentimes with electrophoresis. Uh, chromatography, as I've discussed earlier, the large molecules will pass freely. You can use ligand affinity chromatography. Chemical moiety on the resin will bind the protein of interest. Other proteins are eluded. You can remove these with a salt and remove that particular protein. High performance liquid chromatography is where pressure, so it's high performance, not high pressure, high performance liquid uh, uh, chromatography. Is applied, this reduces transit time and amount of diffusion of protein of interest. This is used in uh, commonly a lot of times in <clears throat> biological systems. You can use this uh, to ascertain hemoglobinopathies uh, using the, this characteristic of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, separation method. Uh, again, if you don't know anything about the protein, you can use several methods and see which one points you in a given direction. Electrophoresis is really not useful for separation, more for research. You can also use this uh, electrophoresis uh, for uh, <clears throat> other moieties aside from proteins. We'll discuss some of that. It's generally a polyquilbine gel matrix, and the size and shape determine mobility. 
and the migration will occur until we hit an isoelectric point, which is uh, what's used where the protein uh, where, uh, gets a net charge of zero, the mobility stops, and you have you can have isoelectric focusing where you apply a pH gradient to this and get further uh, breakdown or further separation of proteins that way. But usually you just use uh, you know uh, regular electrophoresis. Two-dimensional electrophoresis is also used. You have one pH going in one direction, you separate proteins in one at one pH, and then use the second pH to uh, separate the, the the equivalent ones. You take uh, advantage of the isoelectric points that can occur at any point in the uh, in the protein. So <clears throat> the uh, uh, for uh, for electrophoretic uh, methods, you have a sample that is applied uh, very uh, 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 calmly and uniformly. You don't want to spray this around. You want to keep these uh, immaculately clean. Don't let them dry. There's a uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, the electrodes are over here. Uh, the anode and cathode migration is going in this direction, so you can get various separation. You can apply markers uh, to have a, a baseline. Uh, then you can have uh, the different uh, bands that are, uh, that are present and see which ones of these will match. This is used commonly in a lot of uh, forensic and uh, identification uh, applications as well. So you can have uh, you can start with the un, uh, uh, uninduced cells and then get further separation and, and, and then after various purification steps you uh, you can apply this. So you can use this at different stages of a protein purification. Eventually when you get to here then you can declare victory. So to monitor the progress you want to look at, if you're looking at enzymes, you can look at the enzyme activity as a fraction of the total amount of proteins. You can do a protein concentration using Lowry or Bayourette uh, methods. We'll discuss that shortly. <coughs> uh, enzyme activity will be the total amount of enzyme and the enzyme that you activity that you get as a function of protein concentration. And as you go through each purification step, you can get a change of that number and, the, uh, and this becomes a ratio. So the ratio of the enzyme amount to the total protein is a ratio, and then the ratio that you get uh, as the protein concentration uh, increases uh, with uh, particular pur uh, purification steps is a fold purification. So we talk about tenfold, 100, 500 fold purification as the, as the uh, aforementioned uh, steps occur in the process. So you want to look at the activity and the total protein after each purification step, and this is used commonly. And that will be good for, for today. Thank you very much.